now that we know that the 2022 question for the big issue and Vogue is going to be centered around media language, I thought this video might be useful. Start by having a look at the types of questions you might get um, for these two texts. And that there, there will be others, but these are two fairly standard ones. How is media language used to construct meaning? And how is media language used to construct viewpoints and ideologies? The two questions are, of course, interchangeable, and the ideas that I'll be going through here will be relevant to both of them. We're going to start with the big issue. And with any big issue question, I think it's really helpful to start with the big issue's purpose. And there are a number of ways of, sum, of summing up the big issue's purpose. They, they do it for themselves in their own mission statement. But from a media studies perspective, really, the big issue is designed to give a platform and a voice to the underrepresented groups in society, particularly through promoting a liberal left wing ideology. And with that in mind, you can then focus on four particular groups who are under or misrepresented in society that the big issue seeks to address. The homeless, racial or ethnic groups, gender and sexuality. And what that allows you to do then is when you're talking about media language is it provides a structure for your answer because you can talk about one, two, three or all four of these groups and that will allow you to, to structure your essay in a meaningful way. We'll start with the homeless then and a quick focus on the front cover. There is lots more to say about this front cover than I'm going to say here. But I'm going to start with the connotations of the word revolution in their headline 25 years of a public publishing revolution and in particular drawing your attention to connotations such as revolution as a social change, revolution as challenging of authority and revolution as a rejection of conformity because all of those link back to the big issue's purpose which is to address miss or underrepresentation, to give a voice to underrepresented groups. And with that in mind, we very much see the foregrounding of the vendors here. The big issue throughout this issue and throughout all of their issues, their primary aim is to foreground and promote their vendors. And we see that perfectly on the front cover of their 25 year anniversary edition, which is your set text. Because even though we have all of those celebrities listed on the front cover, Andy Murray, Theresa May, Sir Alex Ferguson, Nicola Sturgeon, the Dalai Lama, Daniel Radcliffe, etc. It is the vendors that are foregrounded and promoted through the use of those gold capitals at the bottom, thousands and thousands of vendors. And you could even explore the connotations of the choice of gold, really, with its connotations of prestige, of wealth, of status, and therefore giving that those connotations to the vendors and not to the celebrities who they accompany on the front cover here. In terms of a media language theorist, you might want to consider Levi Strauss here and look at the binary of wealth and poverty, which I think is, is a key one for considering media language in the big issue. Here in that binary between wealth and poverty, we have lots of wealthy celebrities, but it is poverty that is foregrounded. It is poverty. The binary is structured in such a way as to promote the issues of poverty over the celebration of celebrity and wealth. We're going to move on to Grayson Perry's letter to my younger self. You can look through the article in your own time. There's lots of detail within Grayson Perry's article that will accompany the ideas we're going to consider here. But of course, now I'm moving on to gender and sexuality. And we very much have a breaking down of the expectations of gender in particular. First of all, we have the dress with the tie on it. And Barthes here um, is a useful theorist to consider because Barthes talks about signifiers and their signified meaning. Well, we very much have the dress 
with its signified meaning of being associated with femininity, and we have the tie being associated with masculinity. Those symbols, Barthes would argue, have become, have taken on a myth-like status through naturalization. They become so familiar to us that the dress associated with femininity and the tie associated with masculinity is unavoidable and completely understandable by any viewer. And therefore, what Grayson Perry does here is combines those two symbols to break down the barriers that exist within gender, to break down the idea that we have to have a binary of main and fe male and female. There is a blurring of the lines here between gendered definitions. On the same note, we might consider the bracelet on one hand and the watch on the other with similar connotations of masculinity and femininity. And to add to the, all that, it's significant that a Grace and Perry is wearing the colours of pride because if there is a breaking down of gender binaries here, then the colours of pride show that um, Grayson is encouraging an acceptance of those varied identities that he is promoting here. We might consider the yellow background with its connotations of, of sunrise, new beginnings, as if we are moving here and the big issue is trying to move us into an age where gender expectation and gender conformity is rejected and broken down. The next section we're going to look at is the moving on article and we're going to consider two of the characters here in particular with a focus on the meaning is the, that is created and the ideologies that are expressed surrounding race and ethnicity. Joel Hodgson is interesting. Uh, we'll look at his costume first of all, and he's wearing a suit which carries connotations of wealth, status and power. Again, Barthes is useful here. He would argue that um, this symbol has taken on that status of myth. It has become utterly recognisable as a symbol of status, wealth and power. You can look at the background of the City of London. Um, so in many ways, Joel Hodgson has become at one with that environment of wealth, status and power. You might look at his posture here and he's in the starting position as if he's on the start of a journey at the start of a race um, with, a, with a clear destination. Uh, or you could look at the plinth that he's on and therefore he is being celebrated in some way. Now Gauntlet here, David Gauntlet might argue that this is a perfect example of modern media giving us a broader range of representations from which the audience might construct or reinforce their own identity. This is easy to read as a progressive representation of a black homeless man who has been given these symbols of wealth and power and status and therefore is moving away from the expectation of the homeless man. But it's important to be evaluative with your examples and consider them with from another angle. And a useful way of doing that is to pair two theorists together. Whilst Gilroy, whilst Gauntlet might argue that this is a progressive representation in the modern media, Gilroy, I think, might argue that this is um, a regressive representation, perhaps, that is centred in colonial ideas because the suit only carries connotations of wealth, status and power in a white Western European vision. And therefore he is being assigned power in a white Western Eurocentric vision. So Gilroy might not agree with Gauntlet to the same extent here, and it's useful pairing those two theorists together. Similarly with Marvina Newton in the Moving On article, we have the high key lighting and the low angle shot, which both um, place Marvina in a position of power and authority. And we therefore, in many ways, get a positive progressive representation of a black homeless woman. We've got the graffiti style background with its connotations of rebellion and rebelling against expectation against norms. 
we've got the tribal colours within Marvina's jewellery and we might therefore see that as an embracing of a modern position in society with her own heritage. This idea that you don't have to be either, you can be both. And that might again be what Gauntlet argues. But Gilroy again might suggest that with that tribal coloured jewellery, again, Marvina Newton is being represented and Africa perhaps therefore being represented in a colonial vision. It is um, supporting the expectation of a, a European, white Euro, Eurocentric audience. And then we could look at, there are many other articles we could look at, but the My Pitch by Donato Barbieri on the, on the final page of our set text is, is particularly interesting because again, here we have a magazine through through the media language that is used, promoting the identity and personalities of its homeless vendors. And first of all, through, through my pitch um, and the facts about Donato, we get a personalization of the vendor and a humanizing of the vendor. So instead of being a statistic, they become human beings in the viewer's eyes. Within the article itself, we get a challenging of views of migrant workers, that conservative view of migrants as being sponges in some way. Well, here we have a man who has struggled and who has fought for his place in society and therefore were encouraged to feel sympathy. There is a construction of the relationships between vendor and reader, the smile on his face, the interaction with a customer on the street um, promotes those ideas. And this is a man through my pitch, through that possessive personal pronoun. We have a vendor given a space and given a platform to take ownership of and to construct his own identity. Moving on to Vogue then, just a, a quick recap of some of the context. There's lots more. Um, a 1960s publication, a time of female sexual liberation and a time of increased consumerism, particularly for women. And those that will be relevant when we come on to consider the meanings that are constructed here. I'm not going to look at the front cover. There's lots been written about the front cover. There's plenty you can find. I'm going to look at some of the, the adverts instead. I'm going to start with the Bare Essentials advert. And in terms of some of the language, we have they're just barely decent and are you woman enough to wear them? And here we seem to have words that are tapping into that newfound sense of female sexual liberation that the 1960s female audience are feeling. But then we get the pink and green tones, this idea that this vision of femininity that we see here is a natural one. And when we go on to consider the, the way this woman is presented here, that is in some ways problematic because we have to consider whether this woman is empowered through her nakedness and the embracing of her sexuality, which is, is easy to argue, or is she weakened through the stereotypical sexualization of the female form, as Van Zunen would argue, and that her nakedness becomes an expectation and she's therefore sexualized for the eyes of a, of a Western male viewer. And Van, Zun Van Zunen would say that the display of the female body in the media is different to the display of the, the man. Um, and, and she would argue that the nakedness here um, is expected for the female where it wouldn't be for the man. We might also argue that the use of pink in bare essentials on her lipstick and on her nails is reinforcing gendered expectations of femininity, or you might say she's taking ownership of it and owning it. Moving on to the imperial leather advert, we, we now seem to get a more regressive representation of femininity. 
we have a woman who seems to be defined entirely within the domestic and maternal role. Not only is she seen here holding the baby, but she has eyes only for the baby, looking entirely at the baby, um, as if that is her sole focus and her sole purpose. We get a contrast between the present and the future, the woman in the present, the baby perhaps the future, and there's a greater sense of hope and liberation perhaps in the baby gazing into the distance than there is in the woman looking at the baby. So there might be a message here about um, liberation for, for the future and for future audiences. And then the picnics, and there are lots of images that you can look at in the picnics section. I've, I've chosen just a couple here. Um, this is the, the Egypt one. And on the one hand, this is very much a progressive view of femininity, a woman who is able to travel to access the world. It taps into that growing sense of female liberation in the 1960s. But gender roles are maintained as well because we have the man in the business suit who seems to be doing some work of some kind. So he is very much entrenched in the business world where the woman seems to be almost an accessory um, for clothes and jewellery here. And there is also the suggestion there that the man's work has paid for this trip in some way. We also get Africa very much defined in a colonial vision here through the costumes and through the subservient role that the guides are playing. Um, so Gilroy and Hall might argue that the stereotypes are very much, particularly the stereotypes of Africa, are very much reductive here. And then finally, looking at the heat wave section, um, and lots of the images here are relevant. We might view this as a progressive vision of femininity because this whole article is about a woman's independence, ability to travel the world. There is also, it seems, particularly in this image, but some of the image, images as well, a confidence in her own sexuality, a sense that she is owning that sexuality and she is therefore empowered through it. But Van Zunen, on the other hand, might argue again that um, she is sexualized in a way that the male body would not be. So that's just a quick look at the way in which media language creates meaning and promotes viewpoints and ideologies in the big issue and Vogue. Hopefully that's useful in allowing you to go back to both of those set texts and apply some of that analysis and understanding to some of the other pages and images that you get in both of those texts.